Wait a second. Now it yeah, works. Yeah. yeah. Just needs some seconds to adjust. Okay. Again, thanks a lot. And let's start. Um, we know pretty much that dark matter has to be a new particle. We know that it's not made of ordinary matter. We kind of think that Mont is not the right description of it. And we're pretty sure that it's not made of light neutrinos. So it has to be a new particle. And presumably it's somehow produced in the early universe. Now, well, we know that from the standard model that uh, composite particles are actually also a great way to study the early universe. For example, as we know the formation of the hydrogen atoms, the recombination into neutral atoms, teaches us something about the epoch about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And from the formation of light nuclei, we know something about the epoch around the second after the Big Bang. So there is actually hope that uh, if we learn something about a sector that contains composite states with some complexity and some additional uh, information can be retained about the early universe even prior to the one second of the Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So the more complexity you have, the or information you in principle can extract from, from it from about the early universe. We know that the matter has structure and this is the way chemists see it and uh, the, our friends in astronomy see it in a little bit more simplified way. Nevertheless, matter has structure. So why not expecting that dark matter also has some sort of structure instead of just being one single state? Basic question again is then is dark matter a some complex phenomenon or just a simple point like particle. That brings me to the uh, slide that is really related to the talk by Michele Redi yesterday. And he very well motivated the question of dark matter stability by copying essentially the standard model structure and adding on top of it an additional confining uh, gauge theory. In this case, uh, we'll focus on SUN or even, for even more concretely on SU3 uh, in the sense that the age group will be exactly the same as in the QCD of standard model. In addition to that, uh, gauge dynamics, there will be also vector-like fermions. That means you have fermions that are can have explicit masses since the left and right handed fields have the same quantum number. You can write down the uh, mass term explicitly without uh, invoking a Higgs mechanism. Now, the nice thing about this theory is that there is an accidental global symmetry, typically baryon number that makes the variance of this new sector stable. It can be broken to a Z2, but nevertheless, there is an accidental, this accidental global symmetry exists and you have a good long-lived or stable dark matter candidate. I will also talk about this scenario where you have actually thermal contact with the standard model. Um, and like uh, the talk by Michaela, where he focused more on the scenario where you have pure gravitational interactions, um, we just uh, studied this um, setup. And uh, so there you don't have to worry about uh, the question if, if there was an like, asymmetric reheating from the inflaton decay or whatsoever. So there were at some point at large temperatures, there were interactions that thermalized the two sectors. And uh, so that sets the initial condition. It's also that we have some sort of interaction between the dark matter and the standard model particles. However, this is a model dependent question and I uh, will come to it in the end, but I would like to discuss a more general um, feature of the system in the bulk of the talk. Mass spectra of the theories are of course, uh, such that you have at large temperatures, you have a uh, deconfined uh, dynamics, you can have quarks, um, different mass scales and some of them may carry also quantum numbers of the standard model and actually making the bridge between the dark sector and the visible sector. Uh, um, alternatively, you could also introduce a new force that couples to the standard model and the dark sector. So there are like some model building aspects here. The main, again, the main part is then after the, you confine your theory that you have um, a spectrum that is made of some sort of baryonic states or um, yeah, baryonic states that are long-lived or stable, and you have light to the lightest composite particles that could be either uh, mesons or gluons, depending on the mass uh, characters in your theory. So in the scenario that Yasun just talked about, you have after the dark sector and standard model sector were in thermal equilibrium or 
were not in thermal equilibrium in, 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 the, in the scenario you talked about, but it, for us, there would be in thermal equilibrium. However, after confinement, the temperatures can um, evolve separately. And then you have still two possibilities. Either the quark masses are much smaller than the confinement scale of this gauge theory, and then you would have uh, the lightest composite particles being some sort of pion, essentially mesons. And um, the uh, dark matter candidate would be a hadron. This is, again, the scenario that Yazon was talking about. And I will, however, focus on the opposite scenario where the confinement scale is much smaller than the mass of the quarks. So if they have really heavy quarks, and at, after confinement, the entire, I mean, the uh, lightest particles around are gluons, so just opposite states of the gluons. The basic or the deep well, complex question here is the relic abundance in this theory. How do we compute the relic abundance of this uh, state that we consider dark matter candidates? And how do we take into account the phase transition? So the usual story is that they have follow some equilibrium distribution over here and eventually they decouple. So the quarks that are um, not yet confined into bound states behave as a normal WIMP that freezes out. And this region is quite well understood because we can take into account some of enhancement bond state formation of the states. And this is very well under control. The question actually arises when we talk about this phase where you transform from um, the unconfined phase into the confined phase. And you want to know what is the fraction of baryons that are actually formed and that will be the dark matter candidate. And how many states are going to uh, form mesonic uh, states that are not stabilized by this accidental symmetry and decay away? <clears throat> so this is the crucial question here. Uh, back in 2017, also with uh, Andrea Mitridace and also Michele Redi, we were looking at this uh, problem and Alessandro Strumia, we were looking also actually at this uh, problem. And um, the first idea that we are pursuing is essentially a geometric uh, picture where you could throw in the, in, the, in the space randomly particles and antiparticles and then just considering by the nearest neighbor, uh, but just asking the question, who is going to be the nearest neighbor to each other? If you have a particle being closest to an antiparticle, you will form a meson. And if you would have three particles or three antiparticles sitting next to, next to each other, you will form a baryon for SU, SU3. And that approach gives you a baryon fraction essentially of order one, being maybe 0.4 for SU3 and 0.3 for SU4, but it's, it's, not a small, it's not a small number. It's really, uh, um, yeah, an order one number. So in, in that point, we uh, they freeze out in the history of the of those particles is very similar to the usual WIMP result. You freeze out, you conform into baryons, and you retain essentially the same, the same amount of uh, particles as you had after you froze out there. So there's a small correction in, in this recombination. However, if you, uh, what, what we did now is to look in more detail at the dynamics of the phase transition itself. And um, it is known from lattice studies that these uh, phase transitions are first order because it is essentially pure glue, uh, young, I mean, pure young Mills theory. And uh, there are data from lattice studies that studied pure SU3 theories. And um, we know uh, interesting and relevant information from the lattice studies that we need needed for our considerations. Namely, when you have this first order phase transition, you, you start nucleating bubbles of the uh, right vacuum in the um, unconfined phase, and they are nucleating all throughout the space. And there are interesting properties that we need from the lattice to study those uh, evolution further. And the, these properties are the surface of the bubbles and the latent heat that is released in this, uh, in this process. So you see one thing here, for example, the phase transition takes place in a fraction of the Hubble time and converts the entire space from the unconfined phase to the confined phase. Also, uh, the dynamics is quite important, then it, it really happens by nucleation of these bubbles and the successive expansion of the bubbles. And there is this um, 
a substantial uh, phase where the bubbles change in size and grow, um, as opposed to the other possibility that you could have, that you form uh, bubbles all throughout space. Your nucleation is rate is very high, uh, high and keeps, keeps being high, and you convert the space without a uh, strong change in size of the bubbles. However, the parameters of the models are such, I mean, the parameters of the latent heat in particular are such, that the light and heat release uh, reheats the universe quickly close to the um, critical temperature, and that prevents the nucleation of further bubbles. And I will show you a plot about, of, of that in a, in a minute. So um, another very important difference to the scenario where what Yasna was talking about, where you have um, a particle that enters a wall from the unconfined, uh, unconfined phase in the confined phase, and penetrates uh, by string by a string breaking. This cannot happen here, here because the particles are much higher. The particle masses are much higher than the confinement scale. Uh, you cannot really pop out of vacuum any quark anti quark pairs. So the particles will be reflected immediately. So the walls are essentially solid uh, objects that reflect the particles from them. What happens now in this? Um, Transition is that you have the formation, uh, the creation of bubbles that uh, start growing, and this release of the latent heat stops the creation of uh, further bubbles. And so the phase transition happens by growth, then percolation, essentially by collision of these bubbles. And then we reverse the picture by saying, okay, we don't consider the individual bubbles, but rather the pockets of the vacuum uh, of the confined phase that contain all the um, heavy degrees of freedom, all the quarks and antiquarks that are being pushed together. And then the bubbles shrink and keep shrinking until the quarks and antiquarks form uh, color neutral states, for example, mesons or baryons, which don't feel the wall. I mean, they don't carry color. So they are leaking out of the wall and uh, are dispersed in the space until the bubble essentially disappears. So I show you like a little animation to demonstrate that. So you have the nucleation, growth of the bubbles, per collision, and then the pockets shrink and release the baryons in the space. Just once more, you have again the bubbles that nucleate. And it's important that you don't nucleate uh, infinite bubbles all the time, because this would mean that um, you would convert the space from the confined phase, from the, the confined phase into the confined phase without substantial uh, contraction, and without the compression of this uh, color um, color carrying uh, states, and this can all be also quite nicely explained by this uh, plot, where you see that the uh, temperature dips below the critical temperature, start forming bubbles, but then by the release of the uh, latent heat, you reheat. Um, or bring up the temperature again close to this uh, critical temperature, and then there is a very small uh, epsilon parameter. The supercoolant parameter is very small, then you uh, stay very close to the critical temperature throughout the rest of the phase transition. And that makes this uh, compressive phase really exist. When we now look at another interesting parameter here is the um, pocket wall velocity. So once you form the pockets, they have a certain velocity. And this velocity is also controlled by this small epsilon parameter that I just showed you, the supercooling being close to the critical temperature. And um, so the typical velocity would be around 10 to the minus 4 if you had the theory without the quarks. However, eventually you will also encounter a counter, counter pressure by the quarks that are being compressed and uh, hit the walls essentially. And that slows the wall velocity even further. And um, this kind of advancing of the walls continues later on by uh, reducing the number of uh, quarks in the, uh, in the interior of the pocket by either annihilation or by formation of color neutral states that can leak out and reduce this pressure. So there's an additional holding mechanism that is to the heavier particles in the, part, in the pockets. Now what we can do is, is an, an analogy to the universe where we have the freeze out, where uh, the freeze happens while, uh, <laughs> while you expand the universe. Now we take the same kind of uh, picture, but now the universe is replaced by the pocket that is shrinking. Now you have 
not the expansion, but rather a shrinking process and compression of particles. But still, you can set up Boltzmann equations that have this kind of local uh, compression parameter. Um, and they fix the different species uh, that you have. So you start first with uh, only quarks and antiquarks. So it's just uh, states of, uh, yeah, with quark number one. And they, they can form diquarks. They, so states with quark number two. And the diquarks can capture, again, additional quarks to form baryons with three quarks. Um, of course, there is a whole network of Boltzmann equations where you have like a quark antiquark uh, state that forms and annihilates, or a quark quark state that forms and captures another antiquark, and that reduces you back to one uh, a single quark state. So there's uh, all possibilities that you can uh, take into account, but they all go uh, can be upper. I mean, they can be all um, considered as contributing either to the single, double, or tri triple quark states of the system, and this traces uh, the evolution of the um, single, double, and triple quark states during the contraction of these bubbles. Now, uh, you see also that we have a leakage of these baryons. Once they form, they kind of start to leak out of the pocket. So there is also an escape term. This is also taken into this account in these Boltzmann equations. So if you integrate over this uh, leak, leakage rate of the baryons out of the pocket, you will end up with a total abundance of baryons that survive the whole process. Well, this is the long story short is the whole thing tells you that there is numerically when you do the computation, you find that there's a gigantic suppression of this uh, symmetric phase. This is all considering uh, quarks and antiquarks that are being trapped in those bubbles. So they are tremendously suppressed by this uh, recoupling of the interactions by contracting them by the bubbles, by the contracting pockets. Now, there is an additional uh, effect that is really important, namely that if you have uh, accidentally trapped a certain number of particles in this pocket, let's call this number N0, there is an um, amount of particles that are, uh, or antiparticles that are dominating over the other uh, kind. So there will be a relative number of one over square root of N particles just by random chance that will not have an antiparticle to annihilate with. And in another pocket, there will be some antiparticles that will not have particles. So there is an accidental asymmetry in each of those uh, pockets when, uh, when they form percolation. And uh, since this symmetric part is annihilated away so efficiently, the only um, particles you are left with at the very end are those asymmetric abundances in each of those uh, pockets that have shrunk away. Now, of course, uh, in the scenarios and model parameter space that we were looking at, those particles are not sticking together. There is no additional force which makes them into nuggets or something. They start free streaming again, and they will pop I mean, they will flow throughout the universe. And uh, by the um, time today, essentially, or even a few, um, essentially Hubble epoch after they were formed, they are again symmetrically distributed. So there is not, it's not uh, the case that you really have matter or antimatter sitting in some different regions of space today, but it's rather symmetrically distributed by now. But the mechanism itself is really based on this accidental asymmetry that is generated in each of those pockets. Now I can show you the survival factor being the number of particles that are uh, left after the phase transition ends in the uh, different region of the parameter space where the lambda is the confinement scale. And this is the ratio of the quark mass uh, to the confinement scale, which starts at 100. So say essentially below 100, our approximations are, is not good because we want to have the strong mass hierarchy of uh, quarks being much heavier than the confinement scale. And then uh, we also end, um, and the parameter space at this in this uh, mass ratio of order 10 to the 4. And I will show you in a second what, why we actually cut the plot off here. But um, the survival factors are 10 to so suppression factors are 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 8 in this uh, green lines here. And this is, of course, much, much, uh, strong, much, a much, much stronger suppression that you would expect from this just combinatorics argument that uh, we did previously. Finally, if you want 
to know what is the relic abundance that pr produces uh, the correct, I mean, wh wh where the dark matter reproduces the correct relic abundance. This is the line in parameter space here, with this band being the uncertainty due to the uncertainty of the uh, parameters of the phase transition that have, uh, um, so the parameters essentially from the lattice are not known to with 100% with accuracy, and this uncertainty translates into a certain arrow band in this uh, plot. So one of the important messages, I think, is that the interaction strength for the freezing out uh, dark matter particles are not that important in the end of the day. Um, but the whole system is much more dominated by the features of the phase transition and this band and the mass scale that you end up with, which is of the order of 10 to the 4 TeV. Um, is really dom is really set by the features of the phase transition, ra transition rather than by the particular quantum numbers and the interactions of the heavy quarks among themselves or with standard model particles. Now comes another part that is actually related to the model building aspects here. You want, um, since I also said that there is a, some connection to the um, standard model that on the one hand sets the boundary condition of the um, of, of, of the temperatures being equal at very large uh, temperatures between the, in the dark sector and the visible sector, but also we always end up with a, a large abundance of blue balls that are confined uh, states of the dark sector gluons. And this is a plot from a paper by Junkiewicz et al. And they essentially show all the different blue ball states that are present in this kind of uh, SU3 theory. And uh, this, those particles are um, produced with a very large abundance if the temperatures of the dark and the visible sector are equal, and they would overclose the universe. So they have to decay away, and they better decay before the Big Bang nuclear synthesis starts. So there are different ways to uh, connect the uh, visible and dark sectors, and these kind of models generate different um, dim uh, dimensionality of operators for the decay of the blue balls. And um, you see, for example, that the generic uh, operator of dimensionality eight is present for all of them, but there are some states that don't have a dimension eight decay operator. And uh, I mean, don't have a dimension six operator that you would have for other states. And so if you have a model, for example, with Higgs portal mediation, you um, would decay for example, all these states, in particular the lightest states, the zero plus plus states, very efficiently away, but you would still have these uh, other states that are living longer than this. So, in principle, the ones, the, the operators that set your lifetime of the global, uh, of this global sector are of dimension eight, quite generically, no matter what kind of interactions you introduce. So, I think that is also an important uh, message here. And um, we are in principle, considering now several scenarios, one is by charging some of the quarks of the drug sector under standard model quantum numbers, and then it, it depends whether you have weak interaction, strong interaction, electromagnetic interaction. However, the uh, region where the lifetime of the globals becomes larger than one second is around here. So things with larger um, of the, the, in this mass hierarchy, so models with, with a hierarchy that is larger than this, um, value feature glue balls that live too long to be viable and to, too long to be consistent with BPN. So there's essentially also a reason why you, you cut off the plot up here. Um, one of the reasons is the glue balls become very long lived. Other, in addition, if you go to even larger um, ratios between the mass and the confinement scale at the end of the phase transition, the compression of the baryons is so large that you have additional effects being present and we also did not really consider those effects. So it's also another reason to cut off the plot at these large masses, mass ratios. There's also another possibility that we also consider currently is that we have an additional prime that mediates the interaction between the dark and visible sector. Here you have a little bit more uh, parameter space open because you could demand that the globals alive, for example, the global lifetime is one second in all of the parameter space. And uh, then you have different values for the, um, coupling strength of the Z prime to the dark sector. And um, then you're only limited by, uh, by perturbativity of your coupling. So eventually, so that, that brings, brings you up to slightly larger mass uh, 
ratios where you have rubles that are decaying away efficiently enough. So there is, again, there is some model building um, opportunities or possibilities here. However, the general feature is really dominated by the, um, by the uh, feature of the, uh, the, the dynamics of the phase transition. One thing I wanted to mention is that in principle, there is some deviation from the prediction here. That is the dash, uh, dashed line is the prediction where you have the pure phase transition. And if you have this low balls that where you maximize the uh, lifetime to one second, there is an additional entropy injection that dilutes your uh, um, dark matter states and you deviate in this parameter space to this uh, purple line. However, given the uncertainty of the parameters of the phase transition, this is not, so even, not even such a huge deviation. But nevertheless, if you have a concrete model, you should take into account and you can compute it. Now, finally coming to the question about interactions and detectability of dark matter states in such scenarios, like we can ask the question, does the dark matter actually interact weakly or just rarely? What do I mean by that is it can in principle interact pretty strongly, however, being so heavy and so rare, it would just not be terribly abundant. Uh, so if we talk a look at the uh, annihilation of states, uh, particles and antiparticles that are composites, this is a toy simulation for um, meson annihilation. And in principle, the annihilation rates are below the ones you would expect for uh, thermally produced dark matter because you first overproduce dark matter and then you dilute it. So the uh, contraction rates are even smaller, and the masses are in the uh, range of 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 3 TeV. So the rates are very low in the sense, I think that at least here, the uh, direct detection or indirect detection for uh, yeah, satellite experiments and neutrino telescopes seems to be an uphill battle. But uh, you never know. So even, but just the fact that your rates are suppressed by the square of a number density, which is very low, makes the whole story very difficult. Seems that in principle, um, direct detection could be in a slightly better position because these uh, residual interactions are quite generic because I said that you would need this dark matter, matter mat standard model and dark matter interactions to make rubles decay. So we have to introduce some sort of interaction or portal. And then we can explore what kind of masses we can actually probe with uh, direct detection given different portals. So in principle, the uh, electroweak loops interactions, for example, for um, SU2 triplet without hypercharge, this is typical, the typical scale of the interactions, like the Wino, um, you have um, pretty slim chances to test uh, very large masses as, such as 10 to the 6 uh, GeV. Uh, with the Higgs mediate interactions also are not terribly promising. However, if you had hypercharge and then coupling to the Z, Z boson, you could actually come close to the relevant mass parameter space. Also in the Z prime model, of course, you have a lot of freedom but to choose the mass and the um, and strength of the interaction. And in that sense, you have, could also have a strongly enough interacting dark matter, the dark matter uh, the, and direct detection experiments could test it. What I find particularly interesting actually are interactions that are really strong. So when you start playing with models where you have the strong QCD charge in them and you really interact strongly. I think this is a cool thing to explore because you could be above the ceiling from the direct detection experiments underground and then you could explore other possibilities. And well, yeah, so in this mass range that we want to test, the strong nuclear interactions could actually be something that is even testable now and not excluded yet. What could be the new search directions to look for those things? Uh, I just wanted to main, mention a few examples of even other simple experiments, but still, which, which still do an interesting job. For example, this one was based on a paper by John Beacom and uh, Chris Capiello and um, Professor Collar from um, Chicago University, where they had actually a simple detector, but um, it set on the uh, overground and had two detector modules, and they looked for events that would come from above, and they could do a cut on the coincidence uh, reaction in the first and second detector unit, 
and um, everything that has cosmic ray particles would move relativistically and a dark matter particle would move non-relativistically so you could in principle distinguish uh, by velocity essentially and they did a search of about a month of data collection and they could exclude in previously unexplored region of dark matter at very large masses and very large cross sections um, so i think there is a there are ways to tune and make the direct detection experiments sensitive to those very large cross i think this is an interesting way to move forward and test further this large mass and large cross section scenario also you could uh, look for other signals where have accumulation or annihilation in celestial objects, including our Earth. One is a very interesting search that was um, based on um, exotic nuclei and exotic isomers that could be um, hit by dark matter particles, and then then they would could be the decay of those exotic isomers could be triggered by um, interactions with dark matter. And there was a paper by Paskulov and collaborators. Where they looked at this possibility, where um, of course this plot is cut off at 10 to the 5 GeV, but it would be in principle uh, it, it's possible to extend the search to also 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 uh, GeV, and um, it probes those large cross sections. And here, this uh, contrast that you see is the fraction of the dark matter that is interacting strongly. Generically, in these models, you have a in principle a mixed scenario where you have some dark matter that has strong interactions and some that is um, has rather weak interactions when you have formed again bound states of doubly heavy dark matter that is actually similar to the papers that we had also with Michele and Alessandro Sumia where we have strongly interacting dark matter but by forming deeply bound states it actually becomes uh, weakly interacting here at those large masses, this kind of interaction would be less efficient and you would have a much larger fraction of states that are hybrids where you have really uh, strong QCD type interactions in the dark sector. And that could be also an interesting way to move forward and search for them. Finally, if you have um, capture and annihilation in celestial bodies, you have to fulfill um, a certain annihilation condition depending on the interaction at, um, they're different, however, in typical uh, thermal models, those um, annihilation equilibrium conditions are met. And uh, the Earth heat flow already does a certain, a very good job on covering those very large cross sections where you capture and annihilate inside the Earth. However, it is only true for annihilation to some mediators with a lifetime that is below uh, 0 0.01 second. Otherwise, you would escape the Earth and not really heat it. You could uh, think further and and then look for other uh, objects that are larger and would give you heating signals. And here again, it's interesting to focus on those larger planets and uh, um, such as Jupiter or brown dwarfs. And uh, um, also, those, since those objects would be really probing uh, lifetimes of those mediators uh, or the lifetimes in this case of the glue balls, because you have dark matter with annihilated glue balls that then decay. And here you could probe uh, lifetimes of an order to 0.2 seconds, even though, let's say, the shorter lifetimes would be already uh, cut out by the Earth measurements. You still have a parameter space where you are sensitive to the decay to longer lived states by looking at larger, uh, larger celestial objects. I think this is also an interesting um, opportunity to explore. And here, just wanted to show you that what happens with this kind of brown dwarfs and um, exoplanets, um, Jupiter-like exoplanets, that they have a certain um, If you have this meta heating, you would deviate from the expected cooling curve and produce an overheated population. And in particular, it's interesting that this overheated population would be more heated the closer you go to the galactic center, which gives you an additional handle to subtract backgrounds by saying, okay, this stuff gets hotter when you look closer to the center of the galaxy. So you have a differential measurement where you can subtract the background. But this is a, another uh, complicated uh, astrophysics story. So as a summary, I would say nature is uh, complex and I think it's fun to explore this complexity. Thank you.
Thank you, Yuri. Uh, do we have questions? Thanks. So a question on your accidentally asymmetric dark matter picture. So what is the phase basis? So you have these bubbles that expand and then the symmetric, the symmetric component and it's in the space between the bubble walls and only the asymmetric, accidentally asymmetric component is left. Right. So phase space distribution of this asymmetric component. I ask because uh, is there any way that the, the distribution of structures after they evolve, they somehow keep track, or there is an imprint. All the matter was so to have been asked. Okay, click to, to find an you. Yeah, so what we estimated is okay, you're so we, we have essentially this kind of matter and antimatter pockets at some point, and then we were estimating the diffusion velocity. It has, and uh, we found that it's faster than the Hubble time at that epoch. So it would, within one Hubble time, it would disperse in all directions and kind of mix up at least the spatial distribution. But you say, okay, even though it has covered all the space, maybe it's still an imprint of uh, having an origin. I mean, for, I mean, from a, having a punctual origin. So at least for this estimate could not answer this question. I mean, I would say there's no pockets of dark matter and antimatter, anti matter and anti dark matter today, but maybe the phase space distribution is affected and we did not calculate that actually. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, velocity, you mean, for example, is, yeah, it's a good question. Any more questions? Okay, now we have to go up. <laughs> I have a question on the wall velocity. Sorry, uh, what density? On the wall velocity, uh, the bubble. Wall density, density yeah. Mm -hmm. So the way you compute it, you assume you have a kind of a thermal equilibrium between the, the bubble wall and the plasma. Right? Uh, well. So you assume that the, mm -hmm. the latent heat mm -hmm. is uh, immediately converted into uh, thermal heat uh, of the plasma. Yeah, I see, right. And that the temperature of the universe mm -hmm. increases accordingly to the, as the bubble wall, as the, uh, the radius increases, the temperature of the universe increases accordingly because as the bubble radius increases, yeah. you transfer latent heat into the plasma and you, you assume that the temperature of the plasma increases accordingly. This assumes then thermal equilibrium is always satisfied. But how can you be sure of this? Okay, uh, so there is a factor, suppression factor for sure, for uh, that makes this uh, process a little bit inefficient because it's you sh from the bubble wall you would shed blue balls. As you do so, there is something like a um, there is a some suppression factor mgb over lambda, which is a numerical factor. This may be e to the minus five, e to the minus six. So there is some suppression in there. But then the globals decay to standard model particles and inject the energy into the standard model plasma. So at least, I mean, at least we engineer or assume that the model is built such that the globals can decay away. That is also important for the other, uh, you know, phenomenology not to overclose the universe, etc. So they have to decay. But there is for sure a certain efficiency reduction factor uh, taking into account that the global is heavier than the temperature at the confinement. Pockets of false computer of the world. One that says the temperature of the universe and one that says the, the, the velocity of the bubble wall. And the two are related because the temperature of the universe depends on the 
latent heat conversion on the, the rate of conversion of true vacuum. Right. So assumes that as the radius increases by delta R, then temperature of the volume increases by delta T. This assumes that the latent heat transfer, the, the, the shell of false vacuum, this energy has been transformed by some mechanisms into uh, an increase of temperature. So my question is what? Because what is assumed in, the, in other literature, what I assume is that the, uh, let's assume we have a constant. The, okay, in the shell is converted into. Right, oh, okay, let me, let me summarize. Okay, so you, you ask what happens or like why does the process dump temperature and energy in the standard model plasma? And that would happen by first, okay, you, you transform a certain region, a certain volume of the pulse vacuum energy that is, in, and that is uh, that energy being released in the model by shedding of blue balls from from the wall, right? The glue. So this delta delta E of the advancing wall would first be transferred into a certain number of blue balls. There is there is this inefficiency factor which I mentioned, and uh, well, all these blue balls then would decay into some sort of um, standard model final states. That is, since they decay by dimension eight operators that are induced by these interactions that you would you can specify in a certain model. Generically, there is, has to be a channel for the global to decay of standard model particles in order to dump the energy and heat into the uh, standard model plasma. So that, that, is, that, is, that is a given, but is, this is the model required. assume, so what is in? So what is in this is assumed, and the glue, glue balls are quanta of the system in the confined phase, right? So this is this is the way you 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 get rid of energy in general. Yes. So there are some modes of the wall that are transferred into this quantity confined phase gauge theory, being the only way. I mean, the only thing you have in this theory are glue balls. Then you can't radiate anything. Let those other people to ask questions. Thank you. So, so I have a related comment. Uh, can, can I speak? Uh, yes, you may. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, I more or less agree with uh, what you said, but uh, I think it is in, so this discussion can be, we can have this discussion even without the decay of the blue balls. Uh, so if there is no decay of blue balls, still the phase transition will proceed. Uh, and uh, uh, it proceeds very slowly, so uh, it must be taken into account the fact that the universe is expanding at the same time. So my, my question is, uh, so do you, do you estimate how, how long it takes to complete the phase transition? How, how long it takes to complete the phase transition? Sorry, so, sorry, Michele, the last question, can you repeat it? Yeah, yeah. So, so according to your view, how long does it take to complete the phase transition? Uh, right. Well, it depends a bit on the parameter space, but we had these models where we have, I mean, it's for each parameter point, it can be calculated. And this is around, uh, it's, compar well, it's not really comparable to the Hubble time. It's 0 0.01. I, I would think that probably it takes even more than Hubble, OK? Because uh, this problem of the energy that has to go somewhere, I think will be resolved because the universe is expanding at the same time. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So you say if the global lifetime, okay, if the global lifetime. So I think the global state will decay much later. So we can uh, decouple the two stories. In most of parameter space, I would think. So, so the, again, the question is about the global lifetime or about what? No, I was trying to understand if uh, your picture is uh, uh, agrees with my intuition. Okay. Uh, and I would think that, uh, so I think 
So there is this problem of where all this uh, latent heat is going, okay? Mm -hmm. I would think it must go in the expansion of the universe. Okay. I don't know if, if you well, agree with this. Well, if it if it if it re if it if it adds to the temperature, the temperature affects again Hubble by being energy density, right? But I mean, here the energy density Hubble is driven by some other sector, okay? Right. So Hubble Hubble is driven by the standard model sector. So yeah. So it, this is not does not affect much Hubble, probably. Well, no, I mean the the so yeah, since since the, the sector does not really dominate the energy budget yet, we have uh, so it, it, yes, the Hubble is not really well. How do you say? How would you see that? So you're saying that Hubble is halted or like changed that this in, in, in this in this picture I show you that Hubble would even take a different I'm just saying to, to really use yeah. uh, conservation energy, you have to consider also that you are expanding the universe. And this uh, uh well no, I mean the, the expansion of the universe or the, the Hubble is com computed from the Einstein equation, right? So we this is takes the energy density as the input. Okay, maybe you can discuss uh, tomorrow on the blackboard. It's simpler. Yeah, maybe. Okay, but I mean, I, so I think when I what I understand from also your question is that if you have like longer lifetime of the glue balls, this whole reheating might be delayed in a way. Right. So that, what uh -huh. was that one of the points you were making? That if you have a finite lifetime or a lifetime that is maximal, as allowed by experiments. Yeah, you could have an effect on the reheating. I mean, that, that's a different story that will come uh, uh, much later, typically. Okay, so after the phase transition is completed. Right. So, so the story of the phase transition you can discuss even if the, the glue balls don't decay. Sorry, I couldn't catch the last sentence. I just said that the uh, so you can discuss the phase transition even if if the globals don't decay. So for example, if they're dark matter. Okay, so if all right, okay. In the in the case of uh, stable gluons, yeah, globals, right? Um, I remember what. Okay, there's there's also this paper by uh, Teresi Strumia and, and and company where they actually considered globals that are stable. And they find essentially the same dynamics. However, because what is important for the energy budget here is, I mean, is, is also that the globals, yeah. Um, so that they, they don't need the global decay in order to um, have this percolation picture, the expansion and the percolation. So I, I don't think like changing the global lifetime will dramatically change the dynamics of the phase transition. Mm -hmm. But I think I mean this again because we have the same results as the the, uh, the other study that essentially has stable globals. They they so uh, Teresi and Strumia and so on they 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 pushed up this ratio mq of a lambda to. I don't know, 10 to the 15 or something, 10 to the 10, gigantic uh, mass scales, which made the glue balls basically stable. And they had the same conclusions in terms of percolation and um, sizes of the bubbles at, uh, at percolation and that this, uh, for, the relevant, so for the relevant double sizes and so on, so they had the same results actually. So 
Sorry, Michele. Is it... Michele, let's discuss. Okay, okay. Or, or let, I think it may it's be okay. more useful to discuss. I'm, not, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Let's discuss this tomorrow. You'll be in tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, any, any more questions from the online people? You can just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, if not, let's ask, uh, let's thank Yuri again.